to you guys as we celebrate this morning the risen Lord, that the fact that Jesus lives, and because he lives, we live. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Luke 24, verse 21. Luke 24, 21. Father, as we in this building gather this morning along with saints around the world to celebrate a risen Savior, Father, I pray today that you might make your presence known in this place. And Lord, that you would begin to minister to us and speak to our hearts. God, we're so grateful that we have the opportunity to celebrate the fact that Jesus not only died, but he was raised again the third day. And that he ascended into heaven and is our soon coming king. And Father, I pray today that as we open your word, that you would begin to speak to our hearts encouragement, comfort, joy, and peace as we look to you, the risen Lord. For it's in your strong name that we pray. Amen. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things happened. The first four words of this verse. But we were hoping. All of us have been there. Maybe some of us are there now. And we can fill in the blank as we look at that phrase, we were hoping. We were hoping for better news. We were hoping for healing. We were hoping for a marriage to work out. We were hoping for kids to turn out okay. We were hoping that we had enough money to survive. All of us have been there. And all of us can express the emotions that go into those first four words in that verse. We were hoping. Like many of you, we have stood beside the gravesides of our loved ones. And we shed tears yesterday. We laid our granddaughter, Mike and Lou's daughter, to rest, Ciela Hope. And there were tears. But, you know, we grieve as not those that have no hope. We grieve because we lose the ones that we love. And we all ask the question, or we all think about, we were hoping. And you pray, and you long for, and you ask, we were hoping. We can relate to these two men this morning. As they were making the seven mile journey from Jerusalem back to the city of Emmaus. I checked it out on the map. That's like you and I leaving here after the service. And all of us walking over to Lexington Hospital on Highway 378. It's right at seven miles. And we just leave the church and we begin heading our way that way. And these guys were going along this road. And this is one of the greatest passages that we find about the resurrection uh, in the New Testament. And I want to talk to you this morning about the subject of hope being restored. Because as we look at the first four words of this verse, we were hoping. We're going to find that it's easy for us to lose hope, to become discouraged, and for many just to throw in the towel. So in these first few verses, beginning at verse 13, I want to tell you a story this morning. And I'll talk to you about how hope can be restored and renewed. These guys, it says in verse 13, were traveling on that day, which would have been a Sunday, to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. 
And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And so it was while they were conversing and reasoning that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another and you, as you walk and are sad? And then the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened these last few days? And he said to them, What things? And so they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed, uh, and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him and to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since all these things happened. And there were certain women of our country who arrived at the tomb early and astonished us when they did not find his body. They were saying that they had seen a vision of angels who, were, who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. I want you to use your sanctified imagination with me this morning. And take a journey with me with these two men as they go down the road to Emmaus. And they are going down this road. And the text tells us as they were walking... They were rehearsing the events of the last few days. How many of us, when we go through pain and difficulty and life seems hard and we've lost our hope, we, 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 we talk about all the things that are going on. Their conversation was full of disappointment and discouragement. They were trying to make sense of it all. No doubt the question we ask all the time was the one they asked as they walked down the road. Why? Why did he have to die? Why did he have to be crucified? I don't understand. I am confused. And sometimes when we lose hope and we begin to talk about it, we find out just how confused we are. And as they were walking and reasoning among themselves and talking about the events of the last few days and, and how it had, it had caused them to become discouraged and to lose their hope, even when Jesus appeared, they didn't recognize God in their pain. And you and I have been down that road too when we began to talk about why things have worked out the way they did. Where was God? Why didn't he answer my prayer? Why didn't he hear me when I call? And we go through those kind of questions when we are discouraged. And when we have prayed and we have sought the Lord and we have trusted and we have believed and, and God didn't answer our prayer, we, like these disciples, don't even recognize God in our pain. And we question and we doubt and we wonder, is God really with us? Is God hearing my prayer? And, and we see that in these men as they're walking and we hear their conversation and we listen to what they're saying, and we feel their heart. And when Jesus comes, they didn't recognize him. But the first thing that Jesus notices about these guys when he talks to them is, why are you guys so sad? What has happened that has taken away your joy? And they kind of looked at him like, Gee, what planet are you from? I mean, this is before the days of internet and instant news and everything else. And, and they looked at Jesus and they said, are you a stranger around these parts? And haven't heard of the events that have taken place these last few days? These guys were sad. Now put yourself in their shoes. They had been with Jesus and they had watched him as he lived. They had listened to his words and wondered in amazement like everybody else when they said, nobody ever spoke like this man. Nobody's ever done the things that this man has done. And over a period of three years, three and a half years, these guys, like the other people that surrounded Jesus during that time, 
had learned to love him. They saw him, how he loved people, and how he was moved with compassion. They watched him as he healed the sick, and he raised the dead, and he brought hope and life wherever he went. And the crowds thronged around Jesus, and they listened to him teach. And they listened to him talk about the Father as if he knew the Father intimately and personally. It affected these guys. They had learned over this time period to love Jesus. And there was no doubt in their mind that Jesus loved them. But all of a sudden, in the midst of all that, their expectations and hopes came crashing down. They really believed that Jesus was going to set up the kingdom. That he was God's anointed. He was going to march into Jerusalem. He was going to kick the Romans out. And he was going to set up a kingdom that would be established forever. And imagine their shock and pain when instead of conquering the city of Jerusalem, he was nailed to a cross. After being severely beaten and tortured by both the Jews and by the Romans. And then hung on a cross publicly, shamefully for the world to see. And I've been to the place where they call the place of the skull. And I've been to the other place that, that, that there's two places where they say that Jesus was crucified. I've been to both of them uh, in Israel. And, and, and the one that's called Gordon's Tomb is the hill of the skull. And you can see on the top of the hill, it's just it's widely visible to everybody that passes uh, that way. And, and the shame, the, uh, the embarrassment, the lostness that these guys felt as they saw Jesus hanging on a tree and then being taken down and laid into a tomb. And they hung around the city for three days Maybe because it was the Sabbath and they couldn't travel. Maybe because they wanted to be with their, their uh, other disciples or followers of Jesus. For whatever reason, they hung around for three days in the city of Jerusalem and were mourning and were talking about this. And, and the fourth thing I learned in this, this first set of verses is the same pain that you and I experience they kept talking about the events and they kept reasoning among themselves, trying to figure it out. Uh, they didn't recognize God in, in their pain. Uh, they were sad and discouraged. But the big thing for me is verse 21, that's the text that we used this morning, is they had gotten to the place where they had lost hope. You see, this is past tense in verse 21. We were hoping that he was going to be the redeemer of Israel. And you know, maybe even in the back of their mind, they were thinking about what Jesus had told them right before he went into Jerusalem. And you guys remember what Jesus told his disciples, his closest followers, as he was going into the city of Jerusalem? He told them at least three times. He says, I am going into the city of Jerusalem. I will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles. I will be mocked and killed, but don't worry. The third day, I'll be raised from the dead. Maybe in this verse, we see a little hint of discouragement. After three days, it says, they started hearing these reports. It's been three days since all these things happened. What do you think was going through their mind after three days? Maybe that's why they hung around in Jerusalem for three days. Because they were remembering that Jesus said to them, three days I'll be raised from the dead. They didn't see it happen. And now they had lost hope. All of their expectations had come crashing down. Jesus was dead. And now in their mourning, their hope was gone. And maybe in our lives, maybe now, Maybe sometime in the past, we've been in that spot where we have lost hope. What's the use of carrying on anymore? It can't get any harder than this. And if that were the end of the story, we might as well go home, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There's no hope. We might as well live life like we, we you know, that there is no tomorrow. By the way, some people live that way. 
you know, thinking that there is no tomorrow. And guess who's going to be fooled when there is a tomorrow? <laughs> you know, those who believe that there isn't. But they had lost hope. Now, if that's the end of the story, we might as well go home. But, you know, like the old African-American preacher said, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And death and darkness filled the air on Friday, but Sunday came. And in the next few verses, we begin to see a flicker begin to come back in these guys as they're talking with Jesus and he's walking with them. And, and let me tell you today that Jesus understands the pain that we experience. He knows our feelings of hopelessness and helplessness. Hebrews makes that clear. We don't have a savior who can't relate to what we're going through. He knows our pain and he knows our suffering. And he comes along and he begins to talk to these guys. And in the next few verses here, you know, the guys were all, you know, they, they were puzzled. They were perplexed. You know, he said he was going to be raised again. And there's some women now that have, have been to the tomb and it's empty. And they're bringing these stories back. And I, we don't understand. We can't make sense of this. We don't know what's going on. Uh, we're confused. And, and what Jesus begins to do is he begins to minister to them in verse 25. He, he just begins to talk to them. And, and in these next five verses, Jesus basically says four things to them, or does or says four things that I think we want to focus on uh, as we move through this message this morning. Because if our hope has been dimmed, or we have lost hope, or we feel helpless and sad this morning, I believe Jesus has a response for us. And in verse 25, he looks at these guys and he says, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And the first thing that Jesus does to these guys to begin to bring hope back to them is the same thing he does to you and me, by the way, today. It is a gentle reminder to listen to and look for the promises of God in the scriptures. Isn't that what he's doing in verse 25 here? O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And you see, it begins, our journey begins out of despair and discouragement. When we begin to be reminded to listen to and look for the promises of God in the scriptures. But then the next question he asked, he says, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? So not only does he give them a gentle reminder to listen to the promises of the scriptures, all that the prophets have spoken, but he asked them a question about getting things in perspective. Getting things in perspective. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then verse 27, uh, a verse I wish we had the recordings of today, or at least somebody had written it down. But in verse 27, he says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, seven miles, you figure the average person's going to walk about four miles an hour, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, depending on your pace or your speed. But I don't imagine these guys are out there doing some kind of speed walking. I imagine it was a leisurely stroll, you know, just talking as they go and enjoying each other's company and listening to Jesus talk. So for an hour or two, or maybe three, we don't know, Jesus began to opened the Old Testament to these guys and explained to them how every scripture pointed to Jesus. I wish we had that available to us today. I wish I could read how Jesus interpreted all of the Old Testament scriptures. Your friend, Psalm chapter 40, verse 7. It's also quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Jesus says, Behold, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me 
Lo, I come to do thy will, O Lord. And, and so the entire Old Testament speaks of Jesus. John 5, 39, Jesus looked at the religious people of his day and he says, you guys search the scriptures because in them you think you'll find eternal life. But they are the very things that testify of me. So here Jesus is. He gives them a gentle reminder to look to the promises of God in the scriptures. He challenges them by a question to get things in perspective. But here again, he reminds them that the scriptures speak about and point to Jesus. Every time we open this book, every page in this book ought to scream Jesus at us. We ought to be looking for and searching for and finding Jesus in the pages of this book. And I guarantee you, if you take the time and the energy to look, you'll find Jesus in every page of the Old Testament. It is a picture painted by a divine artist of a coming Savior. And every page speaks about the coming of Jesus. But that's not it. As, her, as hope begins to be stirred in them, the reminder to look at the scriptures, a reminder to be, uh, have things in a right perspective, a reminder to see Jesus in everything that you're looking at at the scriptures. But here's my favorite. They drew near to the city of Emmaus. This is verse 28. And this is where they were going to stop. And Jesus indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him. And they said, abide with us, for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to him. One of the greatest places that you and I begin to look at all three of these together, to be reminded of the promises of God. You know, to get things in perspective and, and to see Jesus is when we take the Lord's table together. There's something about communion that kind of just brings things to a perspective. In fact, I think now would be a good time for us just to enjoy the table together. While in our minds, we're thinking about guys who had lost their hope. And Jesus sits down at a table with them and break bread. So for the next few minutes, I want you to watch a short video. The gentlemen are going to come and pass out the communion elements. And I want you to think in the back of your mind as we do this, what's going on with Jesus and these disciples.
And I don't know if you called the words in it. Hope which was lost. But now stands renewed. There was nothing about what Jesus did at this table. Other than break the bread. And bless it. And pass it to these guys. What wasn't your traditional communion service. But something amazing took place. It says their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. You know, when we lose hope, we become sad and discouraged. Whether we're standing at the graveside of a loved one, or we hear news that's not good, or something unexpected happens to us, we're around us. What the Lord wants us to hear and know in that hour and time is the promise that He gave us that He will never leave us nor forsake us. And that He is a very present help in time of need. And we don't have, like Hebrews says, a high priest who has not been touched with our weaknesses, but has. And now by his blood has given us access to the very throne of God. So as we hold together a piece of bread and a cup in our hand, it may be for some of us or some of the folks here, nothing more than a piece of bread and a cup of juice. But for others of us in this room, there is a real connection that's about to take place with us and the Father who loves us so much that He sent His Son. And maybe, just maybe, by holding this bread and taking this cup together, the hope which was lost begins to be reborn. Because we see through a glass dimly, the Bible says, we can't always know the answers. And we can't you know, get a reason for the whys. But we do know that we have a heavenly father. Who has not let our life nor the world slip through his fingers. He is still the sovereign Lord. Let's take the bread and bless it together. Father, I thank you that you love us. And as we hold this bread today. We are reminded afresh and anew that we have a Redeemer, a Savior, whose body was broken for us and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon Him. God, as we take this bread together, would you bless, Father, the bread as we take it? But more than that, as we take the bread, may our eyes be opened and we see Jesus today, right in the midst of our circumstances. May we see Jesus. So thank you, Father. Bless us now as we take, in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus first came, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Try as we may, struggle as we might, there's not a way that you and I can cleanse our conscience of guilt or remove the stain of sin from our life. It is not possible. But what is impossible with man is possible with God. Because Jesus, who knew no sin, took upon himself my sin, your sin, the sins of the world. And as he was nailed to the cross, every drop of blood that was shed was shed in payment for a guilty humanity. What can wash away my sin? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. The cup we hold is a reminder to us today that the word of God says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Why? Because Jesus died in our place. Let's pray for the cup. Father, thank you for this cup. Thank you, Lord, for what it represents to us. That our Savior, Jesus, our Lord and King, took upon himself our sin and suffered in our place and died, Father, to pay the price that we should have paid. We rejoice, Lord, in the fact that our Savior died, shed his blood for us. And this cup, Lord, we drink it, Father, with joy, thanking you that our sins, though they are many, are forgiven and the slate has been wiped clean because of the blood of Jesus. So bless this cup. Bless us as we take in Jesus' name. Amen. We can almost say that's the end of the story, but it's not. You see, these guys had lost their hope. And now, just because of a few simple things, something began to be birthed inside them. Something began to happen. And the hope that had been lost, now in the last four verses of this chapter, finally is renewed. So beginning in thir verse 31. Their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And so they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, seven miles, by the way, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told him about the things that had happened to them on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Three things I want to leave you with as we try to wrap this up this morning. Number one, things change when we see Jesus. When we get our eyes fixed on the Lord and we see the risen Savior, things change. Number two, as we hear him speak to us, there's a burning that begins to take place in our hearts. I've read all the great preachers of all the years that have sermons left behind. And almost every one of them have preached a sermon uh, out of verse 32. Spurgeon says, the great need of our generation is men and women with burning hearts. John Wesley preached about men's need to have hearts that were on fire. I've heard Chuck Smith preach on burning hearts. Many, many pastors have preached on the need for the church today are men and women with hearts on fire for God. But things change when we see Jesus. Hearts burn when we hear him speak to us. And then the third and probably the most important of all this is the very reason that we're gathered here today. Because they were so excited. They said, the Lord is risen indeed. And something about the resurrection changed these men. Who at the beginning of this story were sad and discouraged and had lost their hope. And were just kind of wandering back to their house trying to make sense out of it all. And now it all makes sense. And the sense that it makes is the Lord is risen indeed. And of all the religions of the world, Christianity is the only one. We can go to a tomb today and find that it's empty. Many of you in this room have been to that tomb. I'll never forget the very first time I went there. This was the highlight of my trip to Israel. You walk into the garden tomb. And my wife and I went there at evening. And you walk into the, we walked into the garden tomb. And you could hear these loud voices worshiping God in many different languages. There was a group of Nairobians there that were in their language singing. I, I recognized the songs. I knew the tune of it. 
I, I couldn't make out the words, but they were worshiping the Lord. And over here was another group. All around that garden, people singing songs of praise. And we waited in a long line and finally got to go inside the tomb there. We heard the long story as, as the guide was telling us all the things about the tomb. And then we finally got to go inside. And I, I was probably a little bit more impatient, not as gentlemanly as I should have been. So I went in ahead of my wife. I didn't let her go in for it. And the first thing I said when I went in there, it's empty. And you know, they have done studies at Gordon's tomb. And there is not one single evidence of someone having been buried and decayed in that tomb. Not one. We serve a risen Savior. He's alive. People can argue and debate all day long, and they can come up with all kinds of reasons and excuses on why they don't believe that we serve a risen Savior. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, He lives. Jesus is alive. Alive forevermore, never to die again. Praise the Lord. That's worthy. Yeah, give my hand. You know, we don't think about that as often as we should, but he lives. He lives. He lives forevermore, never to die again. And I've heard all the arguments, and they've been around for 2,000 years. You know, people have debated and argued, well, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did, did his disciples come and steal him away? Or, you know, some other story, he, grew, he, he later revived after going into a cool tomb, lived in India, got married, had a bunch of kids. I mean, a bunch of hogwash. There's no historical evidence for that at all. But the point, the point is, it, this could have been solved 2,000 years ago very quickly. You know how it could have been solved? Where's the body? And there were hundreds of eyewitnesses that saw the risen Lord. That's another message for another day. You know, skeptics have been around for 2,000 years who have denied the resurrection. But Jesus lives. Here's where it all makes sense. We can talk all we want to about this morning of hope, and loss of hope, and renewed hope. But none of it is of any value if we don't understand why Jesus was raised from the dead. We can say, ah, oh, yeah, I, I want to believe, I want to have that hope, but let me just tell you this. The real meaning of the resurrection is this. And the Bible is clear. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And the very best that humanity has to offer, the Bible says, is nothing more than filthy rags to the Lord. So you got people trying to live good lives, and you got people trying to be decent, moral people. None of that really counts. It's not going to get you into heaven. It doesn't absolve you of the fact that you are guilty of violating a holy God's law. Because there's only one way that we can live and not violate God's holy law. And that is to be perfect. And folk, that person doesn't exist. We've all made mistakes. We all have stains. We all wish that we had a second chance. We all wish we could start over again and not make that mistake. You know, how many people live a life of, of, of regret? I wish I hadn't have done that. I wish I hadn't have said that. I wish I'd have acted differently in that situation. I wish I'd have made another decision. And we can't cleanse ourselves of the guilt that we carry because we're guilty. The reason we have guilt is because we're guilty. And the resurrection is a proof that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's also proof that there's not a single thing that you and I can do to get right with God. There's not an act or an action or a deed or a work or anything that we can do to get right with God. And every religion of the world except Christianity, every religion of the world is man's attempt to reach out and touch God. Christianity it's just the opposite. It is God reaching down to touch sinful man. 
And there's nothing you and I can do to get right with God. Many people attempt, but there's nothing we can do to get right with God. One of the great philosophers of old said that every person is born with a God-shaped vacuum in their life. And deep down inside, deny it or not, but deep down inside, you and I were created and have within us the knowledge of God. Romans makes it clear. I can walk outside and something deep down in me says, God made that. Now, we'll try to deny it. You know, we got all kind of theories that we'll propose to say that he didn't do it. We don't take God out of everything. But there's nothing we can do to get right with God. We can't deny that fact. Jesus came, lived a perfect, sinless life, and died all because he was God's lamb who carried the sins of humanity. Every wrong thing that you've done, thought, or spoken. Not only you, but all of humanity. Not was just laid on Jesus, but he became that for us. He suffered in our place. Paid the price for our guilt. Was nailed to a cross after being tortured. And I don't even want to go into the description of what that looked like but just to say this that the book of Isaiah says that he was marred beyond recognition you couldn't recognize that he was a man after he went through what he went through he didn't have to he had done nothing deserving it you and I should have been there but Jesus died took our place because we're guilty before the Lord. And if that were the end of the story, Jesus died on a cross. He died in our place. He suffered on my behalf. He paid a price I could not pay because he loved me so much. And that was the end of the story. Where would that leave us? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then we are still dead in our sin. You see, the resurrection is the proof that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. Amen. And because the sacrifice was sufficient and death couldn't hold him, he's alive. And because he lives, we live. And the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if we believe in him, will also quicken or make alive our mortal bodies. And you see, the decision today that you make is the one that people for 2,000 years have been making. You can go out this door today and continue to live the life the way you want to live. I'm okay with God. I don't need a Savior. I've not done anything that bad. In fact, I don't even believe there's a Savior. You can go out and say that all you want. But there's a day coming when the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. We will face a day of reckoning. And you're saying, well, how do you know that? Well, let me just pose a question to you. What if all I'm saying is in your own thinking, hogwash. None of it's true. It doesn't really matter. I don't believe any of that. And I live my life believing that there is a resurrection and there is a day of accounting. What have I lost if it's not true? Nothing. You might accuse me of being a fanatic or crazy or a little loo you know, loopy or something like that, but I've, I've not really lost anything. But what if I say is true? And you say it's not. And you die. What have you lost? Eternity. The, the decision's yours. God's not going to force you to follow him. But yet the Bible says there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Christ or Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it's sort of like the old uh, Fram oil filter commercial they played on TV 20 years ago where the guy was in a shop and he had a car on a rack replacing an engine and he says, holding the Fram oil filter up, he says, you can pay me now or you can pay me later. You know, the thing is this, what decision have you made?
Does a resurrection really mean that you have eternal life? Only a question you can answer. The worship team is going to come and lead us in one last song this morning. If you're here and have never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior, what are you waiting on? Why aren't you committing your life to Christ? Maybe you're here today and you're, you're one of those people that we talked about without hope. You're sad and discouraged, but you won't quite go far enough to commit your life to Christ. Well, I can tell you today, you're going to walk away still sad and discouraged. The question's yours. Let's stand and pray together. Lord, we rejoice in the fact that we serve a risen Savior. And God, I pray today that we would hear your voice. Lord, that you would speak to us. God, I just pray that today would be a fresh and new beginning for us, just like it was for these guys on the road to Emmaus. Lord, we want a second chance, a fresh start, a new opportunity, Lord, to commit ourselves to you. So as we worship today, would you not speak to us by your spirit? Lord, would you not draw us today? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is risen. Risen indeed. We're going to have an opportunity if you want someone to pray with you this morning while we worship on this last song. The pastors will be available, and I just want to invite you to come have somebody pray with you. Let's end this song with a rounding rounds of worship.